Revelation chapter number 21. We'll begin reading in, well, let's recap where we left off last week. Last week we left off in verse number 22. We talked about how God will dwell among his people in new heaven and new earth and new Jerusalem. And then we'll reread verse number 22 this week. It says, And I saw no temple there, and for the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are the temple of it. And the city had no need of the sun, neither of the moon, to shine in it, for the glory of God did lighten it. And the Lamb is the light thereof. And the nations of them which are saved shall walk in the light of it, and the kings of the earth do bring their glory and honor into it. And the gates of it shall not be shut at all by day, for there shall be no night there. And they shall bring the glory and honor of the nations into it. And they, there shall in no wise enter into it anything that defileth, neither whatsoever worketh abomination or maketh a lie. And they which are written, but they that are written in the Lamb's book of life. We'll stop there if we... We'll pick up in chapter number 22 after we get done with these verses. But last week we learned that although there's a wall, okay, although there are cherubims that are, are angels that are stationed at all 12 of the gates, okay, even though there are defenses to this city, it is made very clear that they are not needed. Okay, the defenses are there because God promised to always protect and take care of his people. Okay, he can't promise that he can protect them if there aren't protections in place. Okay, that's just God keeping his word for our sake, not for his sake, right? But not only are there no dangers in this city, I mean, we just read verse number 27. It says, There shall in no wise enter in anything that defileth, neither whatsoever worketh abomination or maketh a lie. Okay, we've already talked about how he made all things new. Okay, we read the, that verse, how there should be no more death, there should be no more pain, that he wiped away all the tears from our eyes. Okay, verse number 27 is the promise that nothing's ever going to get into that city because of those defenses, because of the Lord's protection that will ever change what God hath done. Can't get into New Jerusalem right, with anything that would cause defilement, that would work abomination, or that makes a lie. And that's how it will be for all of eternity. But see, verse number 23, he said, it's a great city. He said, but the city's got no sun. It's got no moon. Why? Because don't need them. Look, it says, for the glory of God did lighten it. Okay? And the Lamb is the light thereof. So it says God's glory is going to keep this place lit all the time. He said, but if you really want to know what causes that glory to shine and be as bright as it is, it's the Lamb. The Lamb himself is the light of the city, and it's just his glory that keeps everything so bright. Okay, well, it says in verse number 25, I'm sorry, verse number 24, it says, and the nations of them which are saved shall walk in the light of it. Okay, now first off, you want to know how many people are in going to be in New Jerusalem it says nations that's a whole lot of people okay not nation plural nations then all of them got one thing in common it says the nations of them that are what saved what's it take to get to glory for all of eternity it takes being saved you've got to know the lamb the one who's the light of that city but it says the nations of them that are saved shall walk in the light of it. In the light of what? In the light of God's glory. But it doesn't say that we are in the light, that we're bound in the light, that we can't leave. No, it says that you're going to walk in the light. You're free for all of eternity to walk around and bask and enjoy the light and the glory of God. Right? It's not like God made you a airline seat in glory and that's all you've got is that little space right you've got to wait for somebody to come around with a cart to give you a drink or to ask if you want refreshments no you're free to do as you will for all of eternity okay but does say verse number 24 that the nations of them that are saved shall walk in the light of it and their kings of the earth do bring their glory and honor into it talking about that city 
It says that the kings of the earth bring their glory and honor into the city. Now think about it. It says that the kings of the earth. Now I don't know because it doesn't specify. But the way I read that, it says that the kings of the old earth. Keep in mind we're on new earth by this point. We've seen new heaven, new earth, and we're in new Jerusalem. Well, y'all remember how this book of Revelation starts off? John the Revelator reminding us that he has made us kings and priests. I believe that when it says that the kings of the earth, it's talking about from the perspective that John's being given in the spirit of what's to come. What's he seeing? What God wants him to see. That he's saying things from God's perspective and what God wants him to understand so that he can record it for us. I believe that when it says that the kings of the earth shall bring their glory into the city, I think he's talking about all those rewards that we were given at the judgment seat. We bring them with us into New Jerusalem and we bring them into the city. Why? Not because it's our glory, because it's part of his glory. The only rewards that we have are because of the glory of God because of the grace of God, because of the mercy of God, because of the will of God to even decide to use us in the first place. Right? We bring our glory into what? To lay it down before His feet. Why? His glory is the light of the city. He's the light thereof. But His glory is really shining. We bring it in, we lay it down before Him. We say, Lord, the things that You gave us, they really don't belong to us. This city doesn't belong to us. We didn't make it. We didn't labor for it. Right? We weren't the ones that designed it. That Lord, we're just here to enjoy all of eternity with you and show you that all those things that we had, the treasures that we laid up in heaven, right? they weren't for us. We did it out of love for you. They bring their glory into the city not because it's glory made up of their deeds and their works. It's theirs because God assigned it to them as a reward. And they bring it into the city because they want to give it back to the Lamb. That's how I read it. But it says, verse number 25, The gates of it shall not be shut all day, for there shall be no night. That's why gates existed, were for defense throughout history. Okay, a gate is to keep somebody out. When do you close gates? Either when the enemy shows up during the day or at night time so nobody can sneak in. But here, it says, never have to worry about being locked out of this city. Remember, he just said, you're going to walk in the light of that city. I don't think God's going to constrain you to New Jerusalem. Maybe after the first billion years of worshiping and praising him, he's going to say, let's go take a field trip. Right? I want to show you all new earth. Maybe one day he says, I want you all to get a good look at new heaven. I have no idea. But the gates aren't closed. You're free to go. And you're free to come back. Why? Do you think that God would make new heaven and new earth if he didn't intend on those that would be there to enjoy it? God made the Garden of Eden so that he could put man in it. Why would God make new heaven and new earth if all he wanted was you to stay in New Jerusalem? He's saying, don't worry about getting locked out. As long as he's alive, the gates are open. He's alive forevermore, the Bible tells us. We don't have to worry about him disappearing off the map. And he says, it's daytime all the time. Don't worry about getting locked out. Once you're in, you're in. You're always welcome to come back in. But then it says, And they shall bring the glory, in verse number 26, the glory and honor of the nations into it. They say, that's something different. First time it was the glory and the honor of the kings of earth. Now it says, of the nations. Now you can say what you want. In truth, we don't know what the glory of the nations are. But maybe that's everything that people have defiled and stolen away that was rightfully God's throughout all of the time that man has spent on earth. 
Right? The things that they tried to steal away from God that belonged to God. I don't know. Maybe that's just referring to of new heaven and new earth we bring the choicest things of all the world. All the different places that we could go. And what do we do? We bring them in as a tribute unto Him. I don't know. But I do know that because of verse number 27, there shall no wise enter in anything that defileth, neither whatsoever worketh abomination or maketh a lie. I know that whatever is being brought into that city is worthy to be in God's presence. It's not going to defile or make New Jerusalem less by having those things there. That's why I believe that everything being brought in was something that God gave to either the people or to the nations something that was undefiled, untouched, something that's not going to make New Jerusalem unperfect, okay? Imperfect, that's the word I'm looking for, not unperfect. Whatever comes in is pure. That's why there's guards at the gates checking things that are coming into the city. Everything that's brought into that city is to bring more glory and honor unto Christ. That's the point that I want you to get. But it says... There shall no wise enter in anything that defileth. Then there's a colon. As there it says, neither whatsoever worketh abomination nor maketh a lie. He says, stop. When it comes to things, nothing's coming in that's going to defile. Okay? Then there's a, it says it's not going to defile, it's not going to make an abomination. That's something that God hates. Then it says, or anything that maketh a lie. He says, even if it's not a lie, we're not letting anything that can be construed to turn something else into a lie. He says, everything that's coming in, it meets God's standards. Then there's a colon, and it says, but they which are written in the Lamb's book of life. So we go from things to people. He says, the things that are being brought in, the glory of the nations and the glory of the kings of the earth. He says, it's not going to defile anything that God did. That's out of reverence and respect and adoration for the Lamb. He says, those are the only things that are allowed to come in. He says, but everything contained in the Lamb's book of life, all them people are allowed to come. He says, there's no restriction. Do you say, is there a limit to how many names can be written in the Lamb's book of life? I don't believe so. I believe that the book may have blank pages, but I believe that there's enough space in that book for everybody that has ever lived to have their name recorded there. It's not a limitation to say only those that are written in the Lamb's Book of Life are allowed into that city. That's just the list of people that have citizenship there. That's just the role of attendance, if you will. It's not saying you can't get in because you're, there's no space for you in the book. It's saying the reason that you aren't going to be there, if you aren't, is because you didn't want your name recorded in the Lamb's Book of Life. There was space for you, but you didn't want to have it recorded. He says, but if you're in the book, there's no restriction. You can come in. It's the only people that are going to be allowed to come in. But there's still room. It's not a, limit, it's not a limiting thing. right? It is a authority thing who has authority to enter in or who has privilege to enter in who has the opportunity to enter in all have the opportunity those that are privileged to enter in are those that humble themselves before God and ask them or ask him to save them but who has the authority to enter that city those that have been bought with a price those that were on this side sealed with the Holy Ghost and on that side shall never be separated from their God, from the Lamb, from their Lord. All right, now go with me to chapter number 22. Beginning of chapter number 22. It says, And, again, talking about things that he's being shown, He showed me a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding out of the throne of God, and of the Lamb. In the midst of the street of it, and on either side of the river, 
was there the tree of life, which bare twelve manner of fruits, and yielded her fruit every month, and the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. There should be no more curse, but the throne of God and of the Lamb shall be in it, and his servants shall serve him, and they shall see his face, and his name shall be in their foreheads. And there shall be no more night, and they need no candle, neither light of the sun, for the Lord giveth them light, and they shall reign forever and ever. Now we get a few more details here. Verse number one, he says, there's a pure river. To show you how pure it is, the water that's in that river is called the water of life. So there's a river that's full of the water of life. He says, clear as crystal, proceeding out of the throne of God and of the Lamb. Wherever God sits down, you know what comes out of where he sits? Life. It's the waters of life. Is it any wonder that when he said that if any man drink of the water that I give him, there'll be water springing up within him. Why? Because he just produces life. Flows out of him like water. Okay, but it says, verse number two, in the midst of the street of it. Talking about in the middle of the street of the city. Okay. And on either side of the river. Now, hang on a second. It's getting ready to tell you where the tree of life is located. We're limited to geometry and things that we can understand. God's not limited by anything. And this is a place where God hath made everything perfect, made all things new, and he's made them according to his will. But Brother Adrian, I don't understand the geometries of this verse. Right? How can the tree of life be in the middle of the street and on both sides of the river at the same time? Right? Yes, it's going to be a big tree. But he's saying its roots are all over the place. You can't go away and or go to a place in heaven and not be able to see the tree. It's on both sides of the river. It's in the middle of the street. He says, and it's got fruit, different fruit for every month of the year. What's that tell you? It means that God's still got a calendar in glory. New heaven, new earth, and new Jerusalem. But he's saying each one of the fruit comes from what? The tree of life. It says that bear her 12 manner of fruits and yielded her fruit every month and the leaves of the trees were for the healing of the nation. The tree of life brings together again. Right? It's a symbol of healing the bond between man and God. What caused that bond to be broken? Man's disobedience. But man's disobedience was not with the tree of life. It was with the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Go study Genesis, two different trees. They ate of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil and were cast out. Because if they ate of the tree of life, in their sinful state, they would have lived for all of eternity. And God couldn't allow that. That's why I put an angel with a fiery sword at the entrance to the Garden of Eden to make sure that no man that had fallen into sin would ever be able to enter back in. Well, the tree of life and glory, the leaves are what? To heal the nations. It's talking about healing that communion with God. You know that Adam and Eve could have eaten of the tree of life whenever they wanted to in the garden. I preached a message one time on when you get tired of life. Instead of eating from the fruit of the tree of life, what do you eat? You eat the tree of death, of disobedience, of sin. The tree of life was never a problem for Adam and Eve. They were free to eat it. But because they chose to eat the fruit of a tree that they weren't supposed to, what happened? They were cast out. They were separated. They were sundered from God. The leaves of this tree only bring you back to God. If Adam and Eve would have eaten of the tree of life instead of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. They continued in fellowship with God. God only put restrictions on one tree. The fruit of one tree. Didn't say anything about not eating from the tree of life. But in glory. The tree of life. You know why it's got 12 different fruit? Because God wanted it to. But two, God doesn't want you to get tired of the tree of life. Every month, it's got something new for you. It may come back around, but 
in the 11 months that it's been since you've eaten it the last time, somehow it just tastes sweeter this time around. Keeps getting better and better. The tree of life is in New Jerusalem. Why? Because all those that are there will live for forever. There's no restriction on your consumption of the tree of life. If you're walking down the street of glory one day, because it's in the middle of the street, it's also on both sides of the river, you say, you know what? I fancy myself a bite. Reach up, take from the tree. It says that it bears fruit all year round. You know what that means? It's there for you. But, it says that the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nation. Verse number 3, there shall be no more curse. You know what that means? No more sin. Hallelujah. Then again, a colon. There shall be no more curse, but the throne of God and of the Lamb shall be in it. You know where God resides? In a place without sin. That's why today he's in what we would refer to as the third heaven, where his throne's in the side of the north. Why did he make his abode there? Because it's perfect. There's nothing that's at enmity with God and glory. It's his domain. Christ was robed in flesh, but he could not reveal himself in his true glory when he was born of a virgin. Why? Because everything that would have been made of sin would have had to disappear if he showed up in all of his glory. He took on the form of a servant, not on the form of the Lord of Lords and King of Kings. Why? To serve the Father and become your propitiation. But here it says, there's no more curse. If you want proof, it's because God's always hanging around. You want a surefire way to make sure that God's not around in a church or in your life? Introduce sin into it. It's a good way to break fellowship with God. They said, there's no more curse over there. But really, sin brought about the curse of what? Death. No more death. Everything associated with the payments and the penalties of sin are no more. He says that the throne of God and of the Lamb shall be in it, and His servants shall serve Him. Keep that in mind. We're not going to stop there yet. But in verse number 4 it says, And they shall see His face, and His name shall be in their foreheads. Then again, there shall be no more night. Right? Not going to need a candle. Not going to need the sun. For the Lord God giveth them light, and they shall reign forever and ever. So again, he says, there's not even any shadows in heaven. Y'all ever been inside of a house during the day, but you still need to turn the light on? Because like normal people, your house isn't made entirely out of glass. Okay? There are shadows, there's dark spots, there's closets where if you want to see anything, you've got to turn the light on. Right? He's saying there's no place that you can go where there's even a hint of darkness. Why? Because the Lord's in the city. He's the light of the city. But in verse number 4 it says, And they shall see His face, and His name shall be in their foreheads. Verse number 3 it says, His servants shall serve them. And then in verse number 5 it says, And they shall reign forever and ever. Hold up. We've got a group of people that if you're not careful, you're going to think that there's two different groups of people in these verses. The first group are the servants of God in new heaven, new earth, and new Jerusalem. It says that those servants shall see His face and that His name shall be in their foreheads. Well, I don't know. But I do know that the 144,000 God sent an angel and just like the Antichrist tried to take what he knew God would do with his chosen the Antichrist said you've got to take my mark in your right hand or in your forehead. Well it says that an angel was dispatched, we read it, talking about when the vials were opened and the seals were undone and when the trumpet sounded 
an angel went from glory and marked the 144,000 with the name of God in their forehead. Now why did God do that? To identify them as one of His. But it is assembled that their faith had tested true and that they would be redeemed out of the time of Jacob's trouble. So then there's the question. Are those the only people that receive the name of God in their forehead or the original 144,000? I don't know. I know that we're going to have a body that looks like his. I know that we read it when he comes back from glory. He's got a name on his tie that says Lord of Lord and King of Kings. I know that he's got a name that only he knows. Right? But I don't find where Jesus has his own name in his forehead. We're to receive bodies like his. The 144,000, they live during the millennial reign. But then they get to go to glory at the end of it. So long as they didn't believe a lie. If you made it through the great tribulation, I don't think after a thousand years you're going to believe what Satan told you then. Okay? That's just my personal opinion. They've got faith strong enough to make it through hell on earth. And you're telling me that after a thousand years they're going to forget about Jesus just because Satan was unloosed? I don't think so. But they're the only ones that I see that have God's name in their forehead. Does that mean that they don't receive what we receive? No. These servants, it's not a lower pit position in glory. It's a position of honor. You yourself, right, get to be a servant of Almighty God in the most perfect environment that has ever been. Think of it this way, okay? Anybody else here like this? That if there's a problem, you want to be the first person that whoever has the problem thinks about that can help them? Right? You like being the person that can answer questions for other people or can help people fix something, can help people figure out what the best thing to do is. Right? Well, for all of glory, all of eternity, wouldn't you want to be the person that when the Lord says, you know what, I could use a cup from the river of life? Just like David said, man, I sure would like some water out of that well. What happened? His mighty men went and got it. Those weren't servants. They weren't the lowest of the low. They were the best of the best. Well, if God says, you know what, I'd like a little fruit of the tree of life today, and he picks you to go get it for him, that's not a low thing. That is a very respectful and honored thing. Right? It says that there is servants, but serving him is full of joy. There's nothing that's going to be you know, hard or taxing, all those things are done away with. All that will be left is the joy of the Lord and being able to go do something for God. He didn't need to ask you to go get the fruit. He could have done this and it had been there. He didn't even have to chew it if he didn't want to. He could just put it in his mouth. He's God. But no, he chooses to let some serve him. Who's that going to be? I don't know, but if you're of that group of people, it's a position of honor in a rewarding position to be in. But, it also says, and they shall see his face. Those servants, how close are they to God? They can see every detail on the face of God. Now, I'm kind of partial to the fact that God's no respecter of persons. That everybody in the bride of Christ gets the same wedding gown, so to speak. Right? Our positions, there's no, you know, there's no pecking order. The, last shall, the first shall be last, last shall be first. Right? I believe that maybe all of us have a rotation in the service of the Lord. Why? So that we all have a chance to get face to face with Him. But, oh wait, there is more. Look at the end of verse number 5 says and they shall reign forever and ever now who is that they is it talking about the servants is it talking about people that aren't the servants the other group of people we read elsewhere right that we shall rule and reign with him 
Okay, that does come to fruition during the millennial reign. But the millennial reign is God's perfect will on the face of the earth. And it was God's perfect will to include you in his reigning plan. Right? When you got saved, he's got a position for you during the millennial reign. You're going to reign with him. But I also believe you're going to reign with him for all of eternity. The same group that serve also reign with him. But there's no discrimination. Right? There's no hierarchy for all of eternity. There's the Lord and those that were in the Lamb's Book of Life. That's who's there. There's no, well, I got in first. Yeah, you are alive first. Shut up. Not going to be any of that. We'll be known then as we're known now. You'll walk up to somebody, you'll know exactly who they are, even though you've never met them before. Right? You'll have the perfect remembrance and the identity of that person. You'll be able to fellowship with all. Why? Because there's nothing that divides us anymore. There's only things that unify us through Christ. There is no more curse. There's nothing that divides or separates us from God, but also from man. You know what all a man's problems really are? It's sin related. You know, it caused Cain and Abel to have a spat. It wasn't anything other than what? The results of sin. Disobedience on Cain's part brought about envy and jealousy, which then turned into rage, and then what resulted in murder? You know what that is? That's all the result of sin. All of it. Today, you know what the strife and conflict and disagreements, what it all really boils down to? Most of it's a pride thing. Pride didn't exist before sin. Because man didn't have to prove that he was right. All he had to do was believe what God said was right. After sin, that's when it became a contest of who's right and who's wrong. But see here, no more divisions among people. There's no preferred seat in glory and unpreferred seat in glory. There's just the throne of God and then we all get the same seat. To prove it, we've already said that one day there's coming a day if you're saved that in glory you're going to get to sit on the throne with Him. Right? You think that God would allow somebody that's not equipped right, or somebody that's prepared to rule and reign to sit on the throne of God with Him? No. It says they shall rule them. The same group that's doing the servants, the same group that's doing the reigning with them. The only people that are going to be in New Jerusalem are royalty. Born of a royal priesthood. Begat by the one that became our high priest. Right? We are kings and priests through him. But priests serve. Kings reign. And in chapter, we can go back to the beginning of the book. He made us kings and priests here to prepare us for being kings and priests over there. Only here, he made us priests to what? Communicate directly with God. Why? So that we can commune with God through the Spirit and that we may discern what God would have us to do is his will. He gave you the ability to talk directly to God and to hear directly back from God through his word so that you could unhindered, even if he's on an island, banished away, all by yourself, that even on the Lord's Day on Patmos, you could be in the Spirit worshiping God. Right? God equipped you to be able to fulfill what it was God's will for you to be in your life. But then he made you a king so that you could rule and reign over this flesh so that you could constrain this unruly flesh, right, to get in line with what the Spirit would have it to do. He that's in you, talking about he that resides within you, is greater than he that's in the world. God's big enough to help you rein this flesh in so that it can do the will of God. You know what that is? That's practice here. For what? Ruling and reigning with him over there. Serving him over there. You can't be one without the other. Christ is both the Lord of lords and King of kings, but He was also servant to the Father at the same time. He laid down His life for our sake in obedience to the Father. 
But there was never a moment that he was hanging on the cross that he wasn't the king of kings and the Lord of lords. Why do you think Pilate felt so convicted to write that this man's the king of the Jews? Write it in three different languages, hang it above the cross. They said, no, 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 let him say that he said he was the king. He said, no, that man's a king. I saw it in him. I questioned him. There's something special about that fella. I didn't want to kill him. You guys have made me kill him. He says, but I think that he's worthy of that title. Because he was. He had to stay silent throughout his questioning, throughout his scourging. Why? Because if he had announced who he was, there would have been no way that they could have crucified him. As Isaiah prophesied that he was dumb as a sheep is before the slaughter. Sheep doesn't understand that some bad's about ready to happen. It trusts. It follows. So what did Christ do? He trusted and followed the Father's will. What do we ought to do here? Trust and follow the Lord's will. To put on the full armor of God that we can stand against the wiles of the devil. Why? So that we can reign over this flesh and live victorious Christian lives. But you do realize that's just batting practice. Right? Not for the millennial reign, although it is, but also for all of eternity. Because you know what you're going to be doing for all of eternity? The same thing that he, told, he called you to do after you got saved? You're going to be kings and you're going to be priests. Every single one of us. One day you may be serving, one day you may be reigning, but you're going to be doing it all with him. He said, Brother Jordan, how do you come to that conclusion with these verses? That's very simple. His ways change not. His ways are forever settled in heaven. And you can't convince me that the same God that just 21 chapters ago said that He hath made you, not will make you, or has made you for a time, or for a season. No, God said from the day you get saved, you're kings and priests. Period. Full stop. If that wasn't true in all of eternity also, it means that God would be a liar. You know what that means? This book wouldn't be true. So either you believe that God made you a king and a priest because he intended you to stay one, or you think that God has changed his mind at some point throughout the book of Revelation. I don't buy it. I believe that those that are doing the serving are the same that are doing the reigning with him. And I believe that whichever thing that it is that you are led to do, in glory by the will of God for all of eternity wherever you are you're going to be able to see his face I believe you'll be able to look into the eyes of the one that you love above everything else as you either serve him or as you reign for him I believe that at any moment just in case you think it's too good to be true you can turn around and still see the yep it's still real I can see him after all the time of we had it by faith, then we'll have it by sight. And I don't find where he puts a limitation on you. If you want to look at him every second of every day, he's there. You can see his face. There's no barrier. He's the light of the city. There's no candles. There's no shadows. There's no place that you can get in glory to where you can't see his face as he's sitting upon the throne. And you know what's coming out of that throne? Literally, water of life. You know what food there is to eat off of the tree? The fruit of life. Everything that he does, he's saying, I want you to stay here for forever. The water, the fruit, the city, it's all made for what? Eternity. And whether you serve, whether you reign, on the day that you get to sit in the throne with him for however long that is, the whole point of it is that you can see his face now we see it through the scriptures by faith we hear his voice through the Holy Spirit right? we feel the direction of the Holy Ghost but on that day right, forevermore there's no more partition there's no more haze there's no, fo no fog no smoke Nothing that would prevent us from seeing Him. But He doesn't just let you see His glory. 
like Moses got. He doesn't let you just see his raiment or his feet. He'd be God and justified that for all of eternity we can only see his toenails because he could determine that that's all we're worthy of. Right? We don't deserve any of it. But he says, no, for all of eternity you can see my face. Because God's desired for you to see him as he is. So for all of eternity you can. Did you know that IBC is now on iTunes, TuneIn, SoundCloud, and Google Play? Head on over to your podcast provider and subscribe today. And as always, thanks for listening.